Who is in charge of your finance? This is stock taking. Why do we need to take stock? If you work in an office, sometimes we call in auditors. How many people know that? Sometimes we go in for appraisal. Sometimes we go into the store and we check the content, the goods that we have. On your paper, maybe sometimes on your paper, in your computer, you may not have as much. Your, your liability is more than your asset. But when you go into the store, you discover that the goods you have in stock is far, 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 far more than what you have on paper. Then you are excited. Because there's something good in need for you. We need to take stock of our life. Daily, actually. Daily, weekly, monthly, annually, quarterly, seasonally, generationally and track what we're doing. That is what God expects. The foundation scripture for the stock taking is going to be Proverbs chapter 27. And what does Proverbs 27 say in verse 23? It says, be sure to know the condition of your flock. Give careful attention to your herds. For riches do not endure forever. And a crown is not secure for all generations. There are two key, key things I want to bring out from here. One, the condition of your flock. And then security for generations. God is a transgenerational God. And oftentimes we call him the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We will see the Bible refer to Josiah that he behaved like his father David. Even though many generations after. Oftentimes we will see God referring to the activities of Ezekiah that was born hundreds of years after David had left. Because the plan of God is not just for a season. It transcends now. Somebody say now. now. Whatever God is doing with you is not just for now. It is beyond you. So for you to be able to meet the expectation and the demand of God to be a blessing to the next generation, you must always be in charge of your life. So he says, hey, go and check the condition of your flock. Because riches does not endure forever. Check. Stay on neighbor. Check. Now, just like we do check our physical body, it's important to check our financial status. Why do we need to check our financial status? Because according to scripture, I think Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and in verse 12, it says money is a defense. Just like wisdom is a defense. In my translation, it says, wisdom is shelter. Money is shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves those who have it. Wisdom is security. Money is security. The advantage is knowledge will preserve. So today, you are, being, you are becoming knowledgeable. Today, you are receiving information that you can use. Wisdom is the right application of knowledge. But if you don't have the knowledge, how can you apply it? Tell about money is a defense. Now, in Proverbs chapter 10, the Bible records, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city. 
But poverty is the ruin of the poor. Is this talking about defense? When you have money, you can dabble into some things. It says the wealth of the rich is what? Their fortified city. But poverty causes ruin. Another reason we need to look at our financial status is because Jesus wants you to be rich. How do I know that? In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Is that in your Bible? Tell your neighbor, Jesus wants me to be rich. He became poor so that I can be rich. This is not just rich in finances, rich in every definition of rich. He wants you to be rich. So the first thing we're going to do today, the step one, is to do what I call a financial physical. Like we do physical medical examination. We want to do what? A financial physical. I said, take a financial physical. A financial physical helps diagnosis. It helps to determine our actual state of financial being. What's the actual financial status that you have? Then you begin to ask and answer questions like, what do I owe? What do I own? Maybe I've told you this story before, talking to a great guy. And he said to me, I have a lot of assets. I've got two cars. One is $250,000. And the other one is about a hundred and maybe eighty something thousand dollars. And then the guy called me with excitement, said, you know what? I said, what? He said, I bought that car 220,000. But the listing price of that car now is 250. My car has appreciated. Is that true? Is that true? But when you do a, a, a financial physical, you'll be able to know whether that car is an asset or what a liability now don't be deceived by the bankers when you go to the bank they will tell you come and take a facility to buy an asset and then you begin to buy assets like shoes clothes cars microwave cool car ac name it give me you know you even buy games iPad, iPhone, BB, you know, the bank will finance it. Pay nothing. Just take it home. I went shopping with my card. And pastor said, you just do what? Swipe your life away. <laughs> so, now, they tell you you are buying what? Asset. Acquired. The one that pained me most was when I saw in the papers that do you want to go abroad and you cannot afford it? I'm able to say it. Holiday. You come and borrow money to go on a vacation. So you borrow three, just three million. You're a banker. You earn a million naira a month. So three million. They will just take out two fifty every month for the next. 18 months. Does that affect your bottom line? <laughs> do you know why you must do that trip? Dr. Sego has traveled this year. Dr. T has traveled this year. Sister Chrissy has traveled this year. Brother Tomide has traveled this year. Ah, there are several elders. Four have already traveled. Ah, tell me on Ibaje. <laughs> what will I do to I must travel because my travel is a must i don't want them to run me back and say no i'm not up to their standards do you understand what i'm saying even though they are traveling first class i cannot even afford half class but even if it is chronic economy i must put myself inside tell your neighbor i will fly most of the pressure we put ourselves under it's the, it's the advertisement. 
tell me about financial physical. physical. You need to do it. So you need to know what do I owe? Why do I owe it? I was sharing with some people 2008 in the US and I was talking about credit card and the problems. And one woman told me, do you know what? I'm still paying off on four cards and I can't even remember what I used that money for. You just swipe the card, swipe the card, swipe the card. You can't even remember what they are taking the loan for. Tell your neighbor, oh, don't mind nothing. But love. Another thing you need to have a column is, what have I invested in the kingdom? You need to like do a spreadsheet and say, oh, own, invested in the kingdom. Do you know why you need to do that? Because according to Matthew chapter 6, you can turn your Bible to that place. Let's quickly read that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. It said, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. Where moth and vermin destroy. But where, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Where moths and vermin do not destroy. And where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The reason you need to have an account to, to put in and monitor how much have I given out of my income this year is because you need to store up for yourself an investment in heaven. Because everything you invest on earth is subject to decay. But there is something that would never be decayed. And that's what you do that accrues to your account in heaven. Tell your neighbor I have an account in heaven. And don't allow anything on earth to prevent that. And I think that's why God himself, you know, encouraged people to give first before anything. The Bible says, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of your increase. Don't let anything take that from you. Take out as soon as you earn because it's the giver of life. It's the one that gave you the grace and the ability to earn however little. I need a hundred thousand. I've only earned ten thousand. Take out first for God. Because it's your security. That's the only investment that is guaranteed. Every other one is subject to anything. Anything can happen. Tell anyway, anything can happen. Even the best of advice can turn the other way. But that one, nothing can happen to it. So when you are putting your plan, you have to ask yourself, what do I owe? What do I own? How much have I invested this year in that account that, can, that, is, that remains forever? That yields the best dividends. There are so many other ones. You know, the Bible says you should lend to the poor, as in give to the poor. Do you know when you give to the poor, the Bible says, in the days of adversity, the Lord will come and protect you. Jesus said, when you give clothes to someone that doesn't have clothes, you give school fees to someone that doesn't have school fees, you give food to the hungry, he says, you are doing it to who? To me. There are some things you invest in that are forever. But people don't see it. And sometimes it makes you appear stupid. But when you're doing financial, physical, you need to do that. How much do I owe? How much do I own? How much do I have I invested in heaven's kingdom? In the kingdom of God? You need to be able to put that. Can I hear amen? amen? Then the next thing in your financial physical is, what plan do I have for the future? You need to have a column for that. And what am I doing about that? What plans do I have for the future? I'm talking about the steps we're going to take today. I said the first step is what? Take a financial fiscal. Number two. You've now taken, you've done that. You can't do that all at once here. So when you get home, you're going to get a spreadsheet. Clear your dining table, take a biro and write. How much do I owe? How much do I own? How much have I given to God's kingdom this year? Then what plan do I have for the future? And what have I done? about it 
That's step one. Step two. You're going to decide what is your arrival point. What is what? Your arrival point. You know, every journey must have a destination. If you do not have a definite, describable, tangible arrival point, you're going to run amok. Because the Bible says, without vision, what happens? The people perish. Let me give you two examples. Who is the greatest king in the Bible? Who is the greatest king in the Bible? Shout it. Solomon. Solomon. Right. You're right. But let me tell you the disaster of Solomon. I will compare the life of Solomon with another man who wasn't so popular. Nehemiah. There were two people that were used by God. But one did not have a great plan for the future. The other one had. If you do not have a constructive plan for the future, you will just live for now. And woe is that man whose God is their belly. Who live only for now. The Bible says, what does it profit a man? To gain the whole world and to lose what is so. Now, look at, look at, look at Solomon. When David was about to die, David had a goal, he had an agenda to build the temple of the Lord. But the Lord said, no, you're not going to build it. Let your son build it. David went ahead and prepared all the things that Solomon was going to need to build the temple. You know that is in the Bible? All the things gave so much. So for the first seven years of the reign of Solomon, he built the temple. Somebody said build the temple. After the first seven years, the next 13 years, Solomon built his own palace. And the palace was the wonder of the world. People came from everywhere to see it. He had a goal. That let me build the temple of the Lord. After that, now let me build my palace. There was nothing wrong in that. But immediately, if you read the book of 1 Kings from chapter 7 to chapter 11. Immediately after the building of his palace. The next thing we saw in the next chapter. Was that Solomon had 700 wives. 300 concubines. And his wives turned his heart away from God. He had a plan to build the temple. He had a plan to build his palace. After that, he had no more plans. Remember our key scripture? Can we go back to that? Proverbs 27. I said, And a crown is not secure for all generations. If you live a life that you do not leave a legacy for your children, you do not leave inheritance for posterity, you have lived in vain. Solomon lived a life that brought so much fame to him. He built the temple in record time. He built his masterpiece palace in record time. But that was all he did. In fact, by the time of his death, the kingdom was taken away. He was only preserved not to die in shame. Immediately after him, the next king after him, Rehoboam, was useless. May that not be your portion. Whereas his own father left a legacy, left inheritance. He didn't. 